let's go to the U.S. because you, you, Benin is sort of juxtaposed in the chapter with Thomas Jefferson. And I do want to talk a bit about Jefferson because um, we do have these two different stories of him as the kind of president, declaration of independence writer, but then there's the other story of him, the slave owner, the um, father of slave children, uh, and kind of his own kind of the, the African-American family in, co in addition to his white family. And while I was reading through your chapter, I, I remembered back a few years ago, there was a story of, I wanna say it was around Thanksgiving of, a, of an African-American family visiting the plantation on which they had, their ancestors had been enslaved and the family owning the plantation, their descendants were still owning it. It was this kind of almost jubilant get together and then you kind of read in the byline of like, yeah, and see, whoever the ancestor on the male side was impregnated the slave and that's the descendants that we see here on the plantation. And it's like, it was this, this very jubilant storytelling of kind of the reconciliation. And usually when I bring it up in class, I'm sort of also saying, well, why aren't we talking that this, the woman had no, no ability to say no in this. And effectively what we are celebrating here is a rape. Well, um, how does that play into the conversations that we have or not have at plantations where, like in Jefferson's case, um, we have offsprings of the planter who are slaves eventually? Yes, uh, and this has been a discussion, of course, that um, when I um, examined the, the case of Jefferson, of course, that I am not a uh, Jeffersonian, I am not a uh, uh, historian of uh, Thomas Jefferson or of the American Revolution, but I am using him as a case that, uh, as any other, then at the same way that I can study uh, memory of the Francisco Felix de Souza in Benin, Jefferson is a, one of these figures that we can, uh, that you should be able to study as any other figure. And the problem is that, of course, in the United States, first he is a founding father, then uh, perhaps today less uh, untouchable than has been over the, the, the last years. Today, in November 2020, much less than perhaps five years ago. But uh, there is all this discussion about um, then we as historians, we cannot know uh, what was going on between him and Sally Hemings. We do not know her views uh, about uh, uh, her association with him. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that in that family, we have um, then his father-in-law, uh, who was uh, then already the, the, the father of, uh, of, of, of Sally, then there is a, um, how can I say, a pattern of uh, mm -hmm. having uh, then this, uh, uh, having children and sexual relations with these enslaved women. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, an entire discussion about uh, race uh, then, uh, that uh, this justification that it was possible uh, because she was almost white and she was so beautiful that she was almost white. And um, it, then, it, 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 then it, it, even in that discourse, there is this idea, uh, yes, he was having sex with an enslaved woman, but she didn't even look like one because she was almost uh, white. And uh, the difference is also uh, one of the elements that I try to touch, I, I don't know if I was successful in the book, is this idea that, um, and this is a discussion that we had on social media, and I remember one journalist uh, in a famous uh, newspaper who uh, almost said, wrote that uh, Jefferson, that Sally was his uh, sort of wife, uh, that uh, historians agreed that it was the case. No, she was an enslaved woman owned by him. Uh, whatever was the nature of this relationship, uh, legally she was an enslaved woman who died 
uh, we do not know where she's buried. She didn't inherit any property, and even his enslaved children. Uh, he freed two, the other two who were allowed to leave, they didn't inherit anything. And if they were allowed to leave, it was because they changed their identities and passed uh, as um, white individuals. Uh, and this in a period of when there were individuals who would legally free uh, their children. Now, the, the, the point that I try to make in the book is also this idea that, th that Jefferson is always presented as a sort of a monogamous man that had his wife, the, the official one who died, uh, and then he found another wife that was enslaved, and because she was enslaved, but th that it was in the <laughs> in the context of a monogamous uh, relationship, and it doesn't seem very clear that that could be the case. There were plenty of enslaved women in that plantation, and this is an element that is never addressed, whether or not he was having. Um, then uh, sex, and in the case, having sex is not even the, the good word, uh, then in the terms of today, it would be uh, raping then other enslaved women. And one of the issues that uh, for the collective memory is important is that that plantation had not only the Hemmingses that were associated uh, by blood with him, but there were 300 people living there as enslaved people. And the memories that these individuals were enslaved by him uh, and who were not the Hemmingses uh, could be different as well. But I think that when we study that, what we see is that much, uh, uh, even historians, local historians, archivists, and so on, they played an important role to uh, to to not allow this story to to come out, and it, it is with uh, the work by Annette uh, Gordon Reed uh, that uh, this story um, reemerged. But it's still uh, all this issue of the, the the big question continues to be: what is the nature of a relationship between a slave owner who owns and an enslaved woman? Uh, can we, in this context, have uh, talk about a sort of romantic, is uh, then <laughs> um, or even as some people suggest, exactly consensual um, um, uh, relationship? Because it, it, many of the debate has been about, for example, the term mistress, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, that has been enslaved mistress or enslaved mistress. Uh, is still being a mistress is uh, uh, a status that uh, you choose to, to, to be or not, which could not be uh, her case. Yeah, and, and I think the other challenge that you have with the Jefferson story, it's not just that this happens and that we finally start with kind of scholarship to look at it, but it's also that we have Monticello with that kind of um, the grounds, the, the plantation of Jefferson, where a lot of people go and they, they want to quote unquote learn about Thomas Jefferson, but certain stories are just not properly being explored um, on those grounds. Yeah, it's true, it's true. There was, uh, I would say that, uh, and it's hard when you are writing a book about that because of course that uh, during the period, during the research, I visit the places, uh, mm. I talked with curators, with the docents who are doing the, the work. Uh, we see also in conferences that people, there are a number of public historians, of course, who have been doing uh, important work to make that story visible there. Now, the, the problem is, of course, that uh, that is, the, that, that is a shrine to Jefferson that has mm -hmm. been there since the, the 18th century. It was built for him. Uh, the mm -hmm. place is to, to, to commemorate him. And the introduction of uh, the, the main element that was uh, at the heart of that place that was slavery is disturbing for the 
average visitor who is uh, who are then uh, white families you see a, a number of african americans uh, these days visiting the place but it's not uh, you are not going to see many african americans who are like that can't wait to, to go to Monticello. Then this is still a place where people, they go to, to, to hear about him. And uh, there were efforts, there are efforts, but of course, in terms of the, if you analyze this from the point of view of memory, we can see the number of places where uh, there are silences, where there are gaps, where there are stories that, uh, are sort of repetitions that we see elsewhere as well uh, in other plantations.